is Saturday night, October 15th, 1927. A man named Jacob is finishing up a phone call. His 18-month-old daughter is playing in the living room of their new home in uptown Manhattan, and his wife Anne is cooking a meal for the last night of the tabernacle. He hangs up the phone, kisses her, and tells her he's going to go get a cigar and that he'll be right back. A half an hour later, and Jacob has made his way down to Delancey in Norfolk on the Lower East Side. Waiting for him was a man named John. The two had business to discuss. This wasn't the first clandestine meeting between the two. The Bureau of Narcotics had been following Jacob for a few months now and had witnessed several exchanges between the two. But they were not present on this warm fall evening. Jacob and John greeted each other and began to walk down Norfolk Street, oblivious to the black touring car that was driving slowly behind him. Five minutes later, a young boy runs into the Essex Market Police Station and says, Hurry, come quick. They just croaked little Augie. He stretched out on Norfolk Street. Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. Today, we're going to be talking about the last king of the Lower East Side, Jacob Little Augie Organ. He was the last in the line that went all the way back to Monk Eastman. This has been a long time coming. Augie was supposed to be one of the first videos I did. It kept getting pushed back, and I'm glad it did because I was able to get my hands on so much more information than I had back then. But first, we got some business. If you're new here and you like what we do with a few bad men, you want to join the gang, you got to bump off that subscribe button. That's the first thing you got to do. Second thing you got to do is you got to break that thumb. Third thing you got to do is you got to ring that bell and set it for all notifications. So let's get into this. Jacob Organ was born in January 1893 in the city of Minsk in Belarus to Morris and Becky Organ. Sometime in his youth, the family moved to the U.S. And Jacob grew up in a tenement building on Grand Street on the Lower East Side. Because of his slight build, he was known as Little Orgy. The name eventually morphed into Little Orgy. The rough and tumble old lady that was the Lower East Side had seduced many a young men, and Orgy was not immune to her siren song. While he was still in short pants, Augie began carrying a knife. Soon he graduated and he became one of the bad little kids that held Dopey Benny Fine's guns for him during his reign as the king of the Lower East Side. By 15, Augie had a gang of his own called the Little Augies. Later on, they would be known as the Essex Street Gang. These young kids would terrorize push carts and newspaper stands, roll drunks and burglarize stores. They would eventually branch out into the labor racketeering. This racket was refined by Dopey Benny. And before Prohibition, it was the best racket going. They would hire themselves out to the workers or to management, whoever was the highest bidder. And if neither side wanted their services, they would threaten to go to the other side unless they were paid to stay out of it. Just as little Augie's stock was rising, he got pinched with a gat and was sent to the House of Refuge. On May 31st, 1919, Augie had a few hours of freedom when a 17-year-old inmate named Louis Domenico somehow got out of a cell and got his hands on a hammer. He hid and waited, and as the guard came by, he struck him in the head repeatedly, knocking him unconscious. Domenico took the guard's keys and freed 14 other inmates, including Augie. They tied up the guard with bed sheets and locked him in the cell before escaping. Some of the boys made their way to the far end of the island and somehow got a rowboat, and six of the escapees tried to row to the shores of the Bronx. Halfway across, the boat capsized, and the boys had to be saved from drowning by river police, who had been scrambled after the escape was discovered. Little Augie was found later in a children's hospital on the other side of the island. By the time he was released, the Lower East Side was under the thumb of Nathan Kid Dropper Kaplan. Kid Dropper had been a menace since his youth. He got the name Dropper early on. He was good with his hands and gained a reputation for dropping men with one punch. He was notorious for robbing the neighborhood penny pinching pots. He would hide and wait until the pot grew. He would rush in, fist swinging, and scatter the young kids and walk away with the pot. The dropper had returned from Sing Sing in 1919, and after disposing of all competition, he became the biggest labor racketeer on the Low East Side. His gang was available for management or labor, sometimes both. He would often hire his gang out to both sides, and they would stage fake battles in the streets and milk the strike for all it was worth. But when Augie came back, there would be no need for fake battles. Augie put together a gang of his own, full of young toughs including Louis Lepke and Gora Shapiro. Soon the Essex Street Gang and the Dropper Mob would find themselves on the opposite sides of labor disputes. Oftentimes these exchanges would turn bloody and allegedly the Dropper was shot in the leg during one strike. Compared to the Dropper, Augie was small time and the Dropper was not good at sharing. He insisted that Augie join his gang or pay him $200 a week for the privilege of breathing. 
Augie refused, and not long after, he was walking down Clinton Street near Broom when the dropper and two of his men approached him. The two men held a slight gangster while the dropper gouged a chunk of flesh out of his neck with a potato peeler. Augie spent four months in the hospital recovering. When he got out, the dropper caught him again, and this time he carved a half moon into his left cheek that Augie would be famous for. The next time the two gangsters met, the dropper said, Well, I see you're still pretty much alive. Augie said he didn't want any problems. And this time, Augie was able to talk his way out of another slashing. But things had gotten to where Augie didn't feel safe walking down the streets, and his business was suffering. So he made a phone call to the dropper, and he said, One of us has to go. The Low East Side ain't big enough for the both of us. And he challenged the dropper to a shootout, Old Wild West style. The dropper accepted the challenge, but as soon as he hung up with Augie, he picked up the phone again and placed the call. When Augie showed up to the shootout along the East River, the police were waiting. They grabbed Augie and found a 38 revolver in his pocket. He was sent back to Sing Sing. By the summer of 1923, Kid Dropper was no longer using his potato knife to get his way. On the evening of August 1st, 1923, a group of little Augie men were standing on the corner of Broom and Essex when a taxi rolled by and shots rang out. Guru Shapiro was hitting the chin in the abdomen. William Wessinger, known as Footsie, was shot in the head and the leg. He was taken to Gouverneur Hospital, and Gorau was dropped off at the postgraduate hospital by his pals. Two women were also hit with strays and had superficial wounds. Gorau was arrested in the hospital, and he was held as a material witness. On August 11, 1923, 16-year-old Edna Churgan, better known by her Yiddish nickname as Yochi, was going to see her new boyfriend, Louis Midget Louis Schwartzman, a 20-year-old Essex Street gang member. Yochi was from Madison Street, dropper territory. She was previously in a relationship with Izzy Kaplan, the dropper's kid brother. Midget Lewis had been present with Gora during the August 1st shooting. He escaped unharmed and was in hiding. Lewis was in his family home, an apartment that was over top of the synagogue. The synagogue was full of 200 people holding a memorial service for President Harding, who had recently passed away. The young Yochi was head over heels in love and was oblivious to the fact that she was being followed. When she arrived at 22 Ruger Street, Lewis came down to greet her. As the young couple embraced, a taxi pulled up, two men got out, and shots rang out. Both shooters opened up on Midget Lewis. The first two went wild, and the third struck him in the heart. He collapsed dead on the porch. Lewis's mother and two sisters witnessed the shooting from the apartment window. They let out shrieks of horror before fainting. The crowd scattered as the two gunmen waved their guns and made their way to a waiting taxi. Later, taxi driver Harry Taub was arrested, but Yochi did not identify him as the shooter. On Christmas Eve in 1923, 17-year-old Yochi Churgan, filled with guilt for leading the killers to Lewis, ended her own life by drinking Lysol. Augie and the Essex Street gang were on the ropes. The dropper had shot at him on the corner. They killed Lewis the Midget, and a month before, an Essex Street member named Gewalt, which in Yiddish means, misfortune is mine, was jumped in the alley and slashed by the dropper. They were losing this war. They had to do something. It was decided the only way to get the drop on the dropper was to know for sure when and where he would be. Gloria Shapiro broke the underworld code and told the cops that it was the dropper who shot him. A few days later, Captain Cornelius Williams received a phone call. The person on the other end told him that the dropper and his gang had been hired to bust some heads and end the strike. The caller also told him that they had their headquarters in the office building uptown and their leader poses as a businessman. He has his name on the door. Find their headquarters if you can before midnight Thursday. Captain Williams placed undercover detectives familiar with the dropper gang throughout Times Square. Once the dropper was recognized, they bust into the headquarters and arrested the kid and 14 of his men, along with several firearms. The dropper said to the cop, you know I'm going straight, right? His words fell on deaf ears. The dropper was taken in and was given bail, and a court date was set for August 28, 1923, at the Essex Market Courthouse. Augie and his boys now knew when and where the dropper would be. Regardless if he was under police protection, this may be the only shot at getting him. But they needed someone willing to do the deed, knowing there would be no escape. Enter Lewis Cohen. Cohen was a small-time member of the Essex Street Gang who worked in the laundry. He was a friend of the late Midget Lewis, and the dropper had been putting a squeeze on him too, demanding that he start a labor dispute at his job. But Cohen was in no position to do so. But the dropper threatened that if he didn't, he'd have to give him 500 bucks or else. When the dropper got to the Essex Market Court on the 28th, Gore Shapiro testified that the dropper was not the man who shot him. The case was dismissed, and the dropper smiled as he left the courtroom. But his day was not done yet. 
he had to go up to a midtown court where he had to deal with his weapons case. As he was being ushered into a taxi, Lewis Cohen pushed his way through a crowd holding a pistol wrapped in a newspaper. The dropper kissed his wife. She told him that she would meet him at home when he was done. The first detective got in, followed by the dropper. Before Captain Williams could get in, shots rang out. Lewis Cohen fired four times through the rear window of the taxi. Two bullets put holes in the straw hat of Captain Williams and grazed Detective Jesse Joseph in the cheek before wounding the driver in the ear. Two slugs hit the dropper, one in the jaw and one in the back, which penetrated his heart. After the first shot, he tried to jump out of the cab, but collapsed on the sidewalk. Kid Dropper's wife leapt at Cohen. He aimed his gun at her, but she didn't care. She grabbed a slight Cohen by the shoulders right before the police came and subdued him. He was taken upstairs, and while he was there, Mrs. Kaplan lunged at him again, trying to claw at his throat, saying, Why did you kill my man? Why did you kill him? Nathan Kid Dropper Kaplan was taken to Bellevue Hospital, where he died shortly after arrival. After the shooting, the cops found little Augie and his lieutenant, Samuel Weiss, known as Two-Gun Sammy, in the crowd. They searched and found that they were both packing heat. They were arrested and charged with conspiracy to kill the dropper. Days later, they would be released for lack of evidence. But as they walked out of the courthouse to cheers, they were both rearrested. Sammy and little Augie were charged with gun possession, and little Augie was sent back to Sing Sing to serve out the remaining 27 months on his sentence for violation of parole. Lewis Cohn was found guilty of murder but was spared the electric chair. He would be back on the streets by the late 30s, where he would work for Lepke and Gora in the garment district. He was eventually killed in January of 1939 during the hit of Danny Fields, the man who Charlie the Bug Workman went to see after he clipped Dutch Schultz. Lewis was not the intended target, he just happened to be with Danny when the shots rang out. In October 1924, one of Augie's men was standing in front of 88 Essex Street when a taxi pulled up and shots rang out. Two men fired at Porchester, dropping him where he stood. A young taxi driver named Benjamin Siegel was brought in for questioning. The young man said that he had never seen the shooters before. They got into his cab and instructed him to go to Essex Street. After the shooting, they instructed him to drive off. Obviously, Kid Porchester had done something to get on the wrong side of Augie. On July 13, 1926, Augie was arrested after one striker was shot and another stabbed while on the picket line. They were members of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and Augie got the contract from the shop owners to bust the strike. He was arrested and charged with first and second degree assault, but he got off after his wife testified that he was in bed at 8 p.m. and had to be aroused to let in two maintenance workers. The building manager testified the same. By this time, younger members of Little Augie's gang had begun moonlighting for Arnold Rothstein. It was Rothstein who gave him the idea to infiltrate the union and force your way into management. That way, you could play both sides against each other and milk the strike for more money. But Augie was set in his old ways, and besides, he was branching into new ventures. It was 1927, and bootleggers and heroin pushers were raking in the dough, so Augie wanted in. He aligned himself with a man who had a stomach in both pies, John Legs Diamond. Legs was operating a successful beer operation in the Bronx, and he was one of Arnold Rothstein's heroin distributors. Augie's new venture bought him more dough than ever. He moved his family to a big house uptown and left the labor racketeering to his lieutenants Lepke and Gora. The feds were well aware of Augie's move into the dope business and began to tail him. Augie was spending less time on the Lower East Side while he focused on his dope and booze career. Several times, the feds observed Augie and Legs meeting and exchanging envelopes. The problem started for Augie in the fall of 1927. Augie was offered 50 grand to quickly bring the end to a Brooklyn Painters Union strike. Lepke and Gura told him not to accept the money and to prolong the strike and they can get three times as much money. But Augie had deals in the works and he wanted the quick cash. To make things worse, he turned around and gave the job to Legs and his men instead of Lepke and Gura. Now you know what they say, if you don't feed the wolves, the wolves will feed on you. And these wolves by now had grown teeth and saw no reason why they shouldn't be running the show. On Saturday night, October 15, 1927, little Augie Organ arrived for his meeting with Legs Diamond, wearing an expensive brown suit and a gray fedora. The corner of Delancey and Norfolk was crowded with people enjoying the warm Indian summer evening. As the pair began to walk down Norfolk Street, an automobile slowed and three men got out. They walked up behind Augie and Legs. One of the men said, hey Augie. As Augie turned around, shots rang out. One bullet was drilled into Augie's forehead, sending his fedora flying. He spun around and collapsed on the sidewalk. Legs reached for his gun and caught two under the ribs for his trouble. The three men then returned to the car that had never stopped and took off. Legs was piled into a taxi and was rushed to a private hospital at 121 Broom Street, known as Dr. Katz and Dr. Weiner's Hospital. Jacob Lowe Augie Organ was pronounced dead on the scene. 
2,000 people showed up to view the body of Jacob Organ in a funeral parlor at 190 Henry Street. He was laid out in an expensive mahogany coffin with silver handles. But when they got to the cemetery, his body was transferred into a white pine coffin to please his orthodox father. His wife, Anna, was hysterical. She said, what have they done to you? She said, oh, look, Daddy, I got you the best box they had. She clutched their 18-month-old daughter and fainted several times during the funeral. Even though he was 33 when he died, his gravestone said that he died at the age of 26, the age that he died in his father's eyes, and he disowned him for being a criminal. On October 26, Grover Shapiro and Lepke Bokhalter turned themselves into police and were charged with murder. The pair were questioned, but were let go due to lack of evidence. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Little Augie Organ. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure that you bump off that subscribe button, ring that bell, break that thumb, subscribe to the Few Bad Men Patreon channel if you want this early. This video for sure has images I can't show you on YouTube. So if you want to see the uncut version, you need to go over to the Few Bad Men Patreon channel. And if you want to slide an envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is down below. All right, so... This has been a few bad men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.